General Garland, then you would agree that a subpoena lawfully issued by an Article II administrator is to be treated the same as a subpoena lawfully issued by Article I. And I, I, since we're really now talking about a very specific case, I don't want to get into the law. Uh, I don't want to go into specific cases. I just want to say if a Congress at any time in history yeah. issues an Article I subpoena, do you agree that generally that should be treated the same as an Article II subpoena? Well, there's different case law about both, and we would be following the Supreme Court's case law on the subject and making our determinations. General Garland, in 1973, an Office of Legal Counsel memo outlined the parameters for indicting a sitting president and said that you could not do that. 27 years later, that memo was updated to reaffirm that principle. 21 years later, we have seen a former president test the bounds of presidential authority. And I'm wondering, would you commit to revisiting that principle, whether or not a president, while sitting, should be indicted? Well, like an Office of Legal Counsel a memorandum, particularly when they've been um, uh, reviewed and uh, reaffirmed by uh, attorneys general and assistant attorneys general of different parties, it's extremely rare uh, to reverse them. And, uh, we have the same kind of um, uh, you know, respect for our precedents as the, the courts do. Um, and I think it's also um, would not normally be under consideration unless uh, there was an actual issue arising, and I'm not aware of that issue arising now. So I don't, don't want to make a commitment on this question. I don't want to talk about any specific case, but just in general, should a former president's suspected crimes, once they're out of office, be investigated? by the Department of Justice? Again, uh, without, um, I, I don't want to make any discussion about any particular former president or anything else. The memorandum that you're talking about is limited to acts while uh, the per person was in office, and that's all I can say. And, and should that decision be made only after an investigation takes place rather than deciding beforehand a general principle of we're not going to investigate a former president at all? Would you agree that if there are facts, those should be looked at? Again, um, you're, you're pushing me very close to a line that I do not intend to cross. Um, we always looked at the facts and we always look at the law uh, in any matter before making a determination. General Garland, uh, my colleague, Mr. Deutsch, asked you about gun manufacturer liability. And I wanted to follow up and ask, does the recent Pennsylvania decision, which has been vacated and re-argued, change your office's reasoning and thinking? And would you commit to re-examining DOJ's posture in such cases as the law changes in different states. And ask you to refresh my recollection as to the recent Pennsylvania decision about which you're speaking. I'm sorry. Sure. You know, uh, so I have a lot of cases in my head, but that one doesn't come right up. Last year, a Pennsylvania state appeals court held the Protecting Lawful Commerce and Arms Act unconstitutional. And, and so just asking, in light of that, would you I see, I commit see. to re-examining as new cases come in. The Justice Department has taken the position in court that we're going to defend that statute uh, um, uh, as constitutional, and I don't see a uh, ground for uh, changing our mind. I, I expect that the considerations that the judges in the Pennsylvania State Court were brought to the attention of the Solicitor General's office. Thank you. Um, and in the beginning, you referenced the January 6th prosecutions, and just on behalf of my law enforcement family and the law enforcement officers who work in this building, I want to thank you uh, for continuing to pursue those investigations and arrests. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Fitzgerald. Attorney General, thank you. Uh, Appreciate your waving at me. Yeah, thank, thank you for being here. Right. Um, I think we all agree that no one should be above the law. And uh, recent reports had former President Clinton in California. He fell ill. Uh, and was also reported that he had been there to raise, uh, raise money for the Clinton Foundation. Um, in 2017, then Attorney General Jeff Sessions launched a probe to scrutinize whether donors to the Clinton Foundation had been given special treatment by Hillary Clinton when um, Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State. Uh, this investigation wound down in January of 2020. Uh, in September of 2020, press reports indicated that Special Counsel Durham's team was seeking information on the FBI's handling of the Clinton Foundation investigation. Uh, during your confirmation hearing, if you remember, uh, you were asked if you would 
actually ensure that the special counsel, special counsel Durham, would have sufficient staff and other resources to complete that investigation. Uh, now, obviously, um, you've had uh, more than six months on the job, and uh, can you commit to allowing the special counsel Durham's investigation to proceed um, and, and obviously uh, free from any political influence? Yeah, let me just say first about the money. Uh, we're now in a new fiscal year, and as everyone knows, uh, Mr. Durham is continuing. So I think you can readily assume that his budget has been approved. Um, we don't normally make a statement about those things, but since he's still in, in action, um, the provisions of the, of, the, uh, stat, of the regulation, which require approval of his budget for the next fiscal year, are public. So I think you can draw. You would know if he weren't continuing uh, uh, to do his work. I'll take that as a confirmation that the investigation is continuing into the Clinton Foundation, and I think that's important that we well, ultimately wanna, get to I the bottom I don't want to say what it's about. That's up to Mr. Durham. I, 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 I'm not uh, determining what he's investigating. Very good, very good. If I could move on. Um, another thing that came up during your confirmation hearing, you said that the DOJ would be under uh, your, quote, protection for the purpose of preventing any kind of partisan or improper motive in making any kind of investigation or prosecution. And that's the end of your quote. Um, but, you know, I think there's many people uh, that I interact with on a regular basis back in my congressional district that it appears that when you have tackled and targeted specific areas since your tenure began, um, it's been about election integrity measures, pro-life initiatives, and, you know, what's been discussed many times uh, here today, the silencing of, of parents that uh, kind of are very upset about what's going on with some of the school boards. So it appears that you said one thing and made that commitment in your confirmation hearings, but at the same time, uh, it seems that DOJ is specifically targeting many issues that I think I, I have described as conservative issues. I w I'm wondering if you could respond to that. On, on the last point, I hope you can assure your constituents that we are not trying, the Justice Department is not trying to chill their whatever objections they want to make to um, um, uh, school boards. Our only concern is violence and threats of violence. So if you could make that clear to your constituents, perhaps that would help on that question. On the, on the other questions, some of theirs, these are policy differences that are natural between one administration and another, um, different views about uh, what the law is. Um, there will be people who, uh, from the Democratic Party who disagree with my determinations, and you've already heard some of those, and there will be people from the Republican Party who will disagree with my determinations about our filings in civil, civil cases. Well, that comes with the territory. That's, that's what happens to the Attorney General. I'm doing my best to ensure that we make decisions on the facts and the law. And when I said I would protect our, our people from partisan influence with respect to investigations and prosecutions, I meant that. And I, I continue to do that, regardless of uh, you know, which side of, uh, of the aisle is criticizing me for it. An earlier member said that he was very concerned about the previous administration weaponizing DOJ. And I would say I, I share the same concerns, and I would certainly hope that uh, your department would maybe uh, be much more sensitive. Time of the gentleman has expired, of, Mr. Liu. Many of these actions. I yield back. Gentleman yields back, Mr. Liu. Uh, thank you, Chairman Nadler. Thank you, Attorney General Garland, for your outstanding public service. My wife is a school board member. She has been targeted with deeply disturbing death threats. The lack of concern by my Republican colleagues for the safety of teachers, school officials, and school board members is dangerous, disgusting, and utterly shameful. Thank you, Attorney General Garland, for seeking to protect Americans from violence and threats of violence. I'd like to ask you some questions now about racial and ethnic profiling. In 2014 and 2015, Asian Americans, such as Sherry Chen and Professor Xi and others, were wrongfully arrested by the Department of Justice, charged with alleged spying for China, and then months later, all their charges were dropped.
but not after their lives were ruined and they incurred massive legal bills. As we looked into these cases, the only thing that was the same among all of them is that the defendants happened to look like me. They happened to be Asian American. In response, then Attorney General Loretta Lynch ordered implicit bias training for all her law enforcement agents and prosecutors at the Department of Justice. My question to you is, will you commit to implementing implicit bias training at the Department of Justice? So I, 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 I thank you for uh, your comments. Um, as, as you, I, know, I know you know I'm greatly attuned to this problem. That's why the very first memorandum I issued when I came to the Justice Department uh, uh, was to investigate hate crimes um, on a nationwide basis and part particularly against the AAPI community. That's why we have made all of the changes um, required by the No Hate Act, uh, most of them before the act was even passed um, because we were ready uh, on, that, uh, on, on that route. Uh, there's uh, no excuse uh, for this kind of discrimination and uh, it's the obligation of the Justice Department to protect people. Thank, they, thank you. So let me bring attention to a study that came out that shows that this problem is wider than we feared. It was conducted by a visiting scholar to the South Texas College of Law in the Committee of 100, a nonprofit. They analyzed economic espionage cases brought by the department between 1996 and 2020, and the findings are deeply disturbing. Uh, this study showed that one in three Asian Americans accused of espionage were falsely accused. It found that Asian defendants were punished twice as severely as non-Asian defendants. And it showed that the Department of Justice issued press releases much more frequently under these cases if the defendant happened to have an Asian name versus a Western name. So I'm going to ask you again, will you commit to implementing implicit bias training that then Attorney General Loretta Lynch uh, had directed at the Department of Justice. So my understanding is that that was required by the, uh, I think, I can't remember the name, maybe the No Fear Act, I can't remember the name. And um, um, the uh, bar on doing such uh, training um, was rescinded by pre the president in an executive order, I think on the very first day of the new administration. Um, and, um, and so of course uh, we will uh, go ahead with what was required by the statute, including implicit bias training, yes. So if you could look into that more, I appreciate it. So thank you. I'd like to now talk about a case brought under the China Initiative that happened under your watch. The case of Professor Aming Hu, who was also wrongfully accused of spying for China. The evidence against him was so flimsy that a federal judge dismissed the case on a Rule 29 motion. I'm a former prosecutor. I know that those motions are rarely, if ever, granted. The judge found that even viewing all the evidence in the light most favorable to the prosecution, no rational jury could conclude that the defendant violated the law. If we look at one of the darkest periods of our nation's history, over 100,000 Americans who happen to be of Japanese descent were interned because our government could not figure out the difference between the Imperial Army of Japan and Americans who happen to be of Japanese descent. I'm asking the department not to repeat that similar type of mistake. And I'm asking you if you will look into the China initiative to make sure it's not putting undue pressure on the department to wrongfully target people of Asian descent. Internment of Japanese Americans. A terrible stain on American people and on the American government, on American history. I can assure you that kind of racist behavior will not be repeated. There is a new uh, Assistant Attorney General for the National Security Division who is pending confirmation. I'm sure that when he is confirmed, which hopefully will be in the next few days, maybe in the next few weeks, we'll review all of the activities in the department, in his division, and make a determination of which cases to pursue and which ones not. I can assure you that cases will not be pursued based on discrimination, but only on facts justifying them. The time of the gentleman has expired, Mr. 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 Chair, may I ask unanimous consent to enter three documents into the record? Without objection. Okay, the first is a study I referenced called Racial Disparities in Economic Espionage Act Prosecutions, a window into a new red scare dated September 21st, 2021. The second is an article entitled Professor Aquito, is China Initiative out of control? Dated September 25th, 2021. 
And the final document is a letter from 177 Stanford faculty members outlining why the China Initiative is discriminatory and harms American competitiveness, dated September 8, 2021. Thank you. Without objection, the gentleman yields back. Mr. Bentz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General, for being here today. Let me begin by saying I was disappointed with your memo regarding school boards and parents first, because I, like you, am a parent of two wonderful kids. I attended too many school board meetings to count. Uh, I attended many more as a eight-year member of school boards, uh, really long years, I might add. I can assure you that I welcome parents' involvement. And I appreciated their attendance. I listened to, their, I listened to them carefully. Uh, the fact that they took the time to be there after long days at work spoke volumes about how much they care for their kids. And now no one condones violence. No one condemns threats of harm. No one condemns inti uh, condones intimidation. But what has been repeatedly said today is that your memo is far too aggressive, far too loose in its language, far too likely to chill the very parental participation we on school boards so did so much to encourage. I would encourage a supplemental memo. Second, and this goes to the, the assertion at the end of your memo that it is the department's steadfast commitment to protect all people in the United States from violence, threats of violence, and other forms of intimidation and harassment. This goes to the prioritization of the activities of your department. And I would just suggest that we have a situation in Oregon that I think is going to be copied across the United States. Uh, it involves the illegal growing and production of marijuana and cannabis on an almost unbelievable industrial scale based in large and probably irreplaceable part the miserable suffering of thousands if not tens of thousands of people coming across the border illegally and then pressed into indentured servitude by cartels this is not me making this up this is coming from any number of law enforcement agencies in oregon uh, we will not go into uh, the, the challenges on the border other than I wish we had a border. I simply want to say that the people that are coming across by the thousands are being put to work in, in, in situations that are immensely bad. <clears throat> and the FBI, FBI I, by the way, I've spoken with, but your department needs to be doing something about it at the, all the levels you can. And I am tempted to each time I go through one of the horrible things that are happening to these people, refer back to the memo regarding the school board because it seems to me there's been a misprioritization. We are talking about thousands of people that are in these, uh, these in, in human living conditions. And the, 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 um, the, the size of the problem is almost unbelievable. The, based on estimates from law enforcement in J Jackson, Klamath, and Josephine counties in Oregon, the amount being illegally raised and sold across the United States in just one of these counties exceeds 13.5 billion in just one of my counties, I have 36 counties, $13.5 billion, Mr. Attorney General, on the backs of people, human beings brought over the border and probably forced into servitude to pay back the cartels for their uh, in, in immigration. Um, the, I want to mention that the creation uh, of, of this situation is, doesn't all uh, just harm those folks brought across the border. It harms the community. We've had people come in and tell us about going shopping down at the local supermarket and seeing folks wearing big bulky coats and under those coats they can see AK-47s. They have had watermasters approached. Uh, the, the watermaster, the guy who's trying to take care of the water that's being stolen by these cartels. Um, and they've come up to, these, to the watermaster and said, you know what, I'm invisible. You can't see me. You, I can kill you and no one will ever know. That's a threat, that's intimidation. That's the kind of thing that is referred to in your memo, regard, memo regarding parents. I would just suggest there's a misprioritization. Mr. Chair, I would like to offer for the record a letter from Josephine County Commissioners to me, a letter from Josephine County Commissioners to the Governor of the State of Oregon. The order just issued a week or so ago from Jackson County declaring an emergency because of this situation. And finally, a, a, a photos of the, living, the squalid living conditions and a video of the valley showing thousands of hoop houses, some of which we are absolutely sure, or many of which are illegal. Without uh, objection. Mr. With that, I'll... The gentleman yield? I'll yield. Uh, I appreciate the gentleman from the yield. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, in your memo, you said that you are directing the Federal Bureau of Investigation to convene meetings with federal, leader, federal local uh, leaders uh, and state leaders within 30 days of the issuance of this memorandum in each federal judicial district. 94 federal judicial districts, they got until November 3rd to have these meetings. How many meetings have taken place? I don't know the answer. I'm sure that there have been meetings, I'm, but I am sure that they have not occurred. Any idea? All... Any idea how many meetings have taken place? 
I don't know how many meetings. I'm sure that there are, are not. There was so much urgency that five days after a political organization asked the President of the United States for FBI involvement, five days later you do a memo talking about a disturbing spike in harassment and violence and then convening this, this open line of communication for reporting on parents and you say start meetings within 30 days and you, can't come, you come to the Judiciary Committee and you can't tell us what's going on? I'm the gentleman has expired, Mr. Raskin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Attorney General Garland, thank you for your service to the United States know. of America, which is a point of special pride for those of us who live in Maryland's 8th Congressional District. Right-wing violence is now a lethal threat to American democracy. It came to the Capitol when QAnon followers, three percenters, Oath Keepers, Aryan Nations, militiamen uh, stormed the Capitol of the United States in the worst assault on the Capitol since the War of 1812, injuring more than 140 police officers, breaking their noses, breaking their necks, breaking their vertebrae, taking their fingers, causing traumatic brain injury, causing post-traumatic stress syndrome. <coughs> and now, um, with all of the whitewashing by Donald Trump, who lied and said that his mob was hugging and kissing the officers, and by his cult-like followers, like Representative Clyde, who said that this was more akin to a tourist visit, uh, this permission for violence has given license to the darkest impulses in right-wing politics and given rise to conspiracy theory-driven mob violence not just at state, state capitals, like we saw in Lansing, Michigan, which was a dress rehearsal for the January 6th attack, but also it's in schools and it's school boards across the country. Here's some headlines from across the country that tell the story. School Boards Association reaches out to FBI for help as threats violence hit meetings. Loudoun County board members have faced death threats. Prince William meetings have broken down with people screaming. There's been violence across the country. Here's another one. A California teacher is hospitalized after he's allegedly attacked by a parent over face masks on the first day of school. Here's one. An angry parent allegedly ripped off a teacher's mask. It's not the only physical altercation over masks in schools. I'm limited by time here, but there are cases like this all across the country. Now, I'd like to ask you uh, this question, Mr. Garland. Uh, because you've been vilified, you've been castigated by members of this committee for your responsiveness to the National School Boards Association. That is, members of school boards across the country who are reporting this dramatic uptick in violence against school board members, uh, edu education administrators, other parents uh, who have the temerity to go uh, to a school board meeting wearing a mask. Did you tell the school board association to reach out to you? Did you coach them to reach out to the FBI? No. The uh, letter signed by the NSBA president, Viola uh, Garcia, and, S and NSBA uh, executive director um, and CEO Chip Slavin said, America's public schools and its education leaders are under an immediate threat. Did you write those words or tell them to write those words? No. Okay. It, did you violate uh, a, any rule of ethics or any rule of law by responding to this clamor across the country to try to restore some calm and some peace to the schools of America? Uh, no, I didn't. I followed my duty as I saw it. Um, I noticed that not a single member of this committee has cited a single sentence in your memo as violating anyone's rights. Not one. They have not cited a single sentence from your memo because your memo scrupulously follows the difference between conduct and speech. Would you care to re-edify our colleagues about what the First Amendment protects and what it doesn't protect? Well, uh, the Supreme Court is quite clear that the First Amendment protects spirited, vigorous, uh, argumentative, even vituperative speech, uh, perfectly acceptable for people to complain about what their school boards are doing or what their teachers are doing uh, in the most um, um, uh, aggressive terms. What they're not allowed to do is uh, threaten um, people with uh, death 
or a serious bodily injury, the so-called true, uh, true threats uh, line of cases. Okay. Um, do you think that it is going to be important for us to confront violence against public institutions, whether it's the United States Congress, as we count electoral college votes, whether it's against state legislatures and governors who have been subject to assassination plots, uh, or against school board members who maybe don't even get paid. Why is it important, if you agree that it is, for us to defend public institutions, public leaders, and public process against violent intimidation, threats, and attacks? I, I do think it's- Mr. Important. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, the point of order, Mr. Raskin's words need to be taken down. He referred to one of our colleagues as being cult-like, and we don't allow personal attacks under the rules. I'm sorry, who did I refer to as cult-like? Andrew Clyde. I said that Andrew Clyde was in a religious cult? Yeah. A cult-like. Cult that's, that's a derogatory uh, characterization. It's not allowed under the rules. Well, uh, I'll, I'll wait for direction from the chair, but if he objects to the idea that... Not time we have regular I order. Would, I would urge everyone to en avoid engaging in personalities. And the time of the gentleman has expired. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McClintock. Mr. Chairman, can you rule on my port of order? It's uh, Rule 17, Clause 4, Standing Rules not of the House. Not a timely point of order. It would not be timely. It was still... The time. You have to raise it at the time. I did raise it at the time. Mr. McClintock. Look, if any Mr. Offense, uh, look, Mr. I'm Mc happy to resolve this right now. No, 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 no. Uh, Mr. Mr. McClintock. Mr. McClint I'm happy to withdraw the phrase cult-like is applied to Mr. Clyde of Georgia, just, just okay. so we can get on with our business. I'm very happy okay. to withdraw that, and we can talk about it in another context. It's interesting that our, the people- As I said, people should- Are interfering with my speech, but I'm, I'm quite <laughs> fine with it, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> We're just trying to follow the rules, Mr. Raskin. We're told that's important person, around here. Mr. Yeah, McClint, so uh, Mr. Raskin, you, you said enough. <laughs> we all have strong feelings. People should avoid engaging in personalities. Mr. McClintock. Mr. Attorney General, I think the real concern of a lot of parents is they attend a school board meeting to exercise their First Amendment rights, a fight breaks out, and the next thing you know, they're being tracked down by the FBI with a rap on the door, maybe a SWAT team in the morning, uh, because they simply happen to be there. Uh, uh, that is a serious form of intimidation. Whether it was intended or not, that's clearly the effect it's having, and I think you need to be sensitive to that. But I want to talk about the uh, news we received yesterday, uh, that uh, we've seen the highest number of arrests of uh, people illegally crossing our border in the history of our country. 1.7 million arrests this year. Um, it is a federal crime to cross the border uh, outside of a uh, port of entry, is it not? Yes, it's a misdemeanor, that's true. Well, your job is to prosecute federal crimes. How many of you are actually prosecuted of that 1.7 million? So the Justice Department doesn't make those arrests. Those are made by Homeland Security. No, no, but, but the Justice Department is responsible for prosecuting them. How many are you prosecuting? I don't know the answer to that, but they a lot have to be or a referred little. by the... Wait, wait a second. You know exactly how many people you're prosecuting from the uh, riot on January 6th, but you can't even give me a ballpark guess of how many people I you're prosecuting I of can't. the 1.7 million who have illegally crossed our border, committing a federal crime in doing so? I don't have that number on the top of my head, but I'd be happy to have our staff get back to you. Do you think that the, the failure to prosecute illegal border crossings might have something to do with the fact that our border is now being overwhelmed by illegal immigrants who tell reporters they wouldn't have considered making that uh, trip under the uh, Donald Trump administration. I think there are a substantial number of issues driving uh, migration towards the United States from the pandemic. Well, if you ask the migrants, and the if you ask the migrants, they'll tell you specifically what's driving it. They can do it now. They can get in. Uh, Gallup, and, and not fear prosecution from you. Um, you know, Gallup tells us there are about 42 million people living just in Latin America and the Caribbean who intend to come to the United States if they can based upon their polling. A, a lot of people come each year on temporary visas, but then they fail to leave when those visas expire, in, again, in violation of federal law. Do you believe that uh, those who illegally overstay their visas should respect our laws and return to their home countries? 
I think they should respect our laws. It's up to the Department of Homeland Security to make determinations about And, and yet the administration is proposing amnesty to most visa overstays who arrived before January of 2021, including those whose visas have yet to expire. So what you're telling us and what you're doing are two very different things. Let me go on. It's unlawful for an employer to knowingly hire an illegal alien. How many prosecutions are you pursuing under this law? Again, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I'd be happy to have staff try to get back to you. It, it, it shocks me, given the fact that this is now an historic high on illegal border crossings. You're the chief law enforcement officer of our country. You come here before this committee. You devote not a word in your uh, uh, spoken remarks to this issue. You devote out of a 10-page written statement one paragraph simply saying we need to expedite the, um, the uh, Im immigration proceedings uh, for asylum claims, uh, I, I find that astonishing. Let me ask you this. Do, do you agree that an alien who's received proper notice of his or her immigration court hearing, who fails to appear at that hearing absent exceptional circumstances, and is ordered removed in absentia, should be removed from this country? And, uh, I, I'm not really familiar with exactly the circumstance you're talking about. There are rules about removal, and when, there are when, rules when someone that the is ordered Department deported of by a has court, established. I'm sorry. If someone is ordered deported yeah. by a court, should they be removed? If they're ordered deported by a court, then we have an obligation to follow the court's and, and, order. And yet, and yet the president on his opening day in office instructed Customs uh, and um, or, uh, uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement not to uh, conduct such deportations. I'm not familiar with the specific thing you're talking about. I'm sorry. What circumstances would justify an independent prosecutor? So we've had some history with independent prosecutors. Neither the Democrats nor the Republicans seem to like the result, regardless of who is no, but, but Well, let me. there have been multiple reports that, that Hunter Biden made enormous sums of money and, and he's admitted that's because of his family ties. Now that by itself might not be a crime, but there have also now been multiple reports that emails and other communications from Hunter Biden have indicated that his finances were intermingled with those of his father's, including a text to his daughter complaining that half of his earnings were going to his father. If that doesn't call for an independent investigation of the president, what would? So I'm not going to comment about this investigation, but as everyone knows, there is an investigation going on in Delaware by the U.S. attorney who was appointed by the previous administration, and I, I can't comment on it any further than that. That's being done under the Justice Department, not independently, and the Justice Department answers to the president, who, who's implicated in these emails. Time of the gentleman has expired. Ms. Jayapal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Attorney General Garland. Thank you very much for being here and for your commitment to protecting our democracy. Um, I'd like to generally discuss the prosecutions of the January 6th insurrectionists. The prosecutors handling these cases believe that jail time is the appropriate sentence for misdemeanor charges. However, the first misdemeanor defendants to receive jail time were only sentenced last month nine months after the worst assault on the United States Capitol since the War of 1812. I'm trying to understand what the process is for these prosecutions and why there are delays. Does DOJ headquarters have final approval on all plea agreements before they are offered to a defendant? So I, I don't want to discuss uh, these investigations in that respect. I would say that uh, the uh, um, the Justice Department and the U.S. Attorney's Office working together have guidelines for the kinds of pleas that can be accepted so that there are not, uh, there's not, I don't want to use the word discrimination in the, in the racial sense, but that there's not unequal treatment between people who uh, uh, did the same thing. Uh, we can't have every individual prosecutor following a different set of plea arguments. So that's the extent to which um, that, that's um, 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 being organized. This is a, and the question you ask, which is why does it take so long? This is really not long at all. I've been in lots of criminal investigations that took way longer, 
We've arrested 650 people already, and keep in mind that most of them were not investigated on the, uh, arrested on the spot because the Capitol Police were overwhelmed. So they were people who had to be found, and they had to be found by uh, sometimes our, our looking at our own uh, video data, sometimes from citizen sleuths around the country uh, identifying people. Then they have to be brought back to Washington, D.C. Then discovery of terabytes of information has to be provided. Uh, and then all this was occurring while there was a pandemic, and some of the grand juries were not fully operating, and some of the, um, the courtrooms were not fully operating. So I I'm extremely proud of the work that the uh, uh, prosecutors are doing in this case and the agents are doing in this case. They're working 24-7 on this. Thank, thank you, General Garland. That's helpful. Um, I do want to talk about disparity, actually, of, of prosecutions. Federal judges have criticized the department's approach to letting many defendants stay at home or travel for vacation. One judge said, quote, there have to be consequences for participating in an attempted violent overthrow of the government beyond sitting at home. And yet the Wall Street Journal reports that you've told DOJ officials that jailing riots who weren't hardcore extremists could further radicalize them. Uh, General Garland, do you believe that such statements are appropriate to make as the person overseeing these prosecutions? I, I, I don't know where that, that report comes from. My recollection of this is in a completely different context. That is, I, I worry that there will be radicalization in the Bureau of Prisons um, when people are, um, uh, and this is radicalization that has occurred with prison gangs, um, with uh, white supremacist groups in prisons, um, and with uh, radical uh, Middle Eastern groups in prisons. And I con was concerned that the Bureau of Prisons have a procedure for ensuring that that radicalization doesn't spread across prison populations. I General Garland, I, I don't know how to. you could further radicalize people who have attempted to overthrow the government. Um, let's just contrast the department's approach to the George Floyd protests. A participant at a George Floyd protest faced up to five years in felony charges for inciting a riot via social media. In contrast, three white supremacists at the 2017 Charlottesville rally received prison sentences between two and three years for their violence, assault of protesters, and conspiracy to riot. And despite a series of social media posts and videos on January 6th, only one person was ever charged with a felony. I understand all of the challenges that you are facing with what you've mentioned, and I, I, I do appreciate that. Uh, but I am concerned about the disparity of the way sentencing is occurring. Is it fair to say that the department does and should consider deterrence and the gravity of crimes when pursuing both sentencing and pretrial confinement or detention? Uh, the answer to that is yes, but the ultimate determination on both sentencing and pretrial detention is up to the judge and not to the department. There are some judges that are criticizing um, uh, uh, the kind of charges we're bringing being uh, uh, not harsh enough, but there are other judges who are criticizing the same charges as being too harsh. Uh, as, as I mentioned before, this you know, comes with the territory of being a prosecutor. I understand. General Garland, I, I um, just want to say that I think if we are to restore faith in the Department of Justice under your leadership and a new administration, we have to make sure that the disparity of sentencing that we have continued to see under the last administration and with this administration has to be addressed. And I hope that you will do that. And I thank you for your efforts. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady yields back, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, General Garland. Uh, it's good to see you, and it's good to have you before this committee. I, I appreciate your giving us so much time. Uh, as you know, uh, your reach is global when it comes to overseas activities such as the bombing that occurred in Kabul. So the, uh, the killing of 26 uh, August of 13 U.S. troops falls under your jurisdiction, is correct? Or at least the FBI is. is well, the FBI can participate. Um, it's likely also DOD, but it's some combination, yes. Well, the areas of concern uh, media reports, uh, both uh, and public and private statements, indicate that the bomber was, in fact, an individual who had been released from the, uh, the detention center there in Kabul. Can you confirm that? I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, 
I don't know the answer to that. And Can you uh, respond for the record uh, from, uh, I mean, obviously the FBI does know. It, it's leaked out enough that I think that it needs to be made official. To, uh, to the extent that it would be permissible, um, and it's not classified information, then of course we'll get back to you and I'll ask my staff to, to look into this. Well, the, the, the records of those incarcerated at the, uh, at the detention center were public uh, and certainly uh, somebody who has blown themselves to bits would enjoy very few residual privacy rights, I would assume. I don't think it will be a question of privacy rights. Here. Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure we had that. The important point, though, is, in my view, is that there are 4,999 or more other individuals who were released, who were free to roam the streets of Kabul uh, on the very days that we were evacuating. I was in Qatar last week. Uh, and it was reported to us in unclassified sessions that more than 20 percent of the individuals who boarded the aircraft uh, in Doha for the United States, more than 20 percent who came into there, uh, came in with no papers whatsoever. No Afghan papers, no U.S. papers, no other documentations, and that the documentation was produced based on oral testimony. They called it a paper passport. Based on the fact that uh, of the 60,000 plus people that passed through Doha Qatar, 20% of them or more did not have any paperwork. Uh, of the remaining ones, at least 40% had only documentation that it was produced in Afghanistan. How do we know how many, we know some undoubtedly, but how many in fact made the way to the United States? Of the 5,000 plus people who were incarcerated for being ISIS terrorists and the like, how do we know who they are, where they are, and how many of them are in the United States, and what are you doing to discover further? Congressman, you've identified a very serious problem. There was a massive airlift of refugees out of Afghanistan at the very last moment. Um, and that required um, um, vetting at uh, not only at Qatar, uh, but also uh, at Ramstein and the other bases where people were moved to, and then when they moved to the United States. The FBI... And, and I, don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, yeah. but uh, in the remaining time, if you could respond for the record about how many, how many you know, how many you've apprehended, how many you're following, because once we know that tens of thousands of people left Afghanistan who had no evidence of a nexus to the United States and were transported to the United States and knowing that there were 5,000 terrorists that had been recently released, we do have an obligation to figure out what the steps that are being taken to find them and to incarcerate them. Uh, and I recognize that there are a number of people in Kosovo who were identified, so we would certainly include that. Uh, my last round of questioning uh, really goes to the terrible attacks that occurred at Fort McCoy and other places. Um, we have a significant number of, of Afghan slash American bound individuals who are currently committing crimes and who have committed crimes. And so I'd like to, to know one, to the best of your ability, how many cases you're following, not what the cases specifically are about. and what authorities you've been given uh, or need to be given to, uh, to deal with these individuals, including uh, revocation of their paroles, which of course is an executive prerogative, but one that we would like to know, will, the, will individuals who have committed crimes have their paroles pulled? And if so, can they then be deported or at least begin the deportation process? All right, we'll try to get back to you on what we are able to tell you on, on the questions of the crimes that you're talking about. And we're happy to accept it in, a, uh, in an environment where it's not disclosed, but I, I really think that this committee has an obligation to have a good feel for uh, the nature of the individuals, the nature of the crimes, and, and how we're going to deal with them. This is an awful lot of people who are requesting special entry to the United States, and, and as we know, many of them did not do anything for the United States, but simply were able to get on aircraft in the rush at the end. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your excess time indulgence, and I yield back. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.